It is my honor to present you guys with our panel this morning. They flow from all over the world. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Baltazar Tribulano. He is the Country Program Advisor on Child-Centered Climate and Disaster Risk Management at the Plan International in the Philippines. Next, I would like to introduce Minaz Aziz. She is the Chief Executive and Founding Director of Children's Global Network Pakistan. And last, but certainly not least, we have Paul France, the Journalist Publisher Center on Crisis Reporting. Let's give a round of applause to all of our panelists for being here today. So we want to start off in opening the discussion right now with one of the biggest questions that are asked. What are the biggest challenges facing the education sector after a natural disaster? All three of you can have time to reply. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll speak uh, from uh, the context of Pakistan and uh, the context of challenges facing Pakistan. It was not just the floods that uh, took place last year, but uh, we have a huge population, 180 million people, and uh, out of those 50% are youth, and uh, 25 million uh, children are not going to schools. Um, and, and this is and poverty and inflation, energy crisis, uh, existing uh, you know security crisis going on, and uh, with that the floods happened, and they were um, you know going on uh, along the lines of the Indus River, so that impacted the entirety of Pakistan. It was not just one area; it started from one end and went into the other, and the uh, the poorest of the poor were affected. Uh, and uh, the, the most vulnerable, of course, are the children and, uh, and the youth. You know, they were displaced and, uh, you know, the government did not have the responses to respond uh, uh, immediately. So it was basically uh, the UN and uh, other private organizations, students such as yourself who uh, came forward for the relief. But the, the, the children and youth uh, were most affected. Uh, and, and women, because uh, these areas where the, the flood affected, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, along line, the Indus River, are uh, basically, um, you know, uh, uh, women and children who are working for large landholders. So the, the impact, the worst impact was, and, and children, appro approximately three million children were affected uh, because of the floods. And later on, I will go on to talk about the, the education side, that how the floods uh, impacted the education. Well. I'm speaking from the perspective of Haiti, and um, it's kind of interesting. Manaz and I were talking before this began, and um, Haiti has very similar kinds of problems, but it's very different demographically and historically in the sense that Pakistan has 180 million people, Haiti has 12 million people. Um, it also comes from a very different cultural background as well. It's very French. It has this system of schools where there is no formal system in Haiti. One of the questions I was asked before I came here was to say, talk about how do we rebuild Haiti's education system. Well, there's nothing much to rebuild there. There is no system to speak of. There's no much of a public system at all. You'll find some loose system of public schools in Port-au-Prince, but in a lot of the poorer areas of the country, in the Northeast and the Northwest, you have a system of private schools. They're not accountable to the government. They're not accountable to any standards. And about 90% of the schools in Haiti are privately owned, privately run. And we have this assumption in America especially that, oh, private schooling must be wonderful. It's not so wonderful in Haiti. You have, in these rural areas, teachers who are not qualified to be in front of the class. I believe the number that was said to me by uh, Charles Tardieu, who was the former uh, national education minister in Haiti, was that there's about 70,000 teachers of ha in Haiti. About 30,000 of them are qualified to be teaching. And especially, if, this is incredibly atrocious to be hearing this, is that in these rural areas, you see that these teachers have no more than a sixth grade education, and they're teaching classes. 
And you look at the statistics. I know the statistics can't really tell you much, but 50%, more than 50% of Haitians are illiterate. And that directly correlates to the uh, poverty rate, the absolute poverty rate in Haiti as well, where about the same number are living um, without any reading skills. Yeah, in the case of the Philippines, um, the biggest challenge is that education is still being seen as a secondary or tertiary or third priority. In every disaster, I think it's not only the Philippines, but globally, um, during the acute response, meaning right after disaster, people are bringing food, people are bringing water, sanitation, but education, maybe later, two, three weeks after. Education is a right. It is a right that is very important, as important as food. And in fact, most of the responders fail to, to think that education per se, right after disaster, is a very good motivation where parents or children are beginning to recover psychologically, mm -hmm. mentally. So there are lots of good things that people, uh, responders, they have to take education as a priority. Otherwise, there are lots of problems, there are lots of issues. Because education and emergency can bring lots of things. Mm -hmm. People are becoming comfortable, uh, children are becoming happy, they're seeing their classmates, hi! Oh, my parents, they can discuss about problems, issues. So child-friendly space, right after disasters, uh, children can share what are the, 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 the problems and what happened to the parents, what happened to their notebooks, to their schools, and it's itself a recovery, it's itself a solution. So that's the big problem now. People, students like you, have to think that right after emergency or disaster, we have to put education as an important element in terms of recovery. That's all right. You're actually touching on the next question, which is how important is it to rebuild the education sector right after a natural disaster? Manaz, I'll let you start with that. I'll just like to um, walk the audience through the education system in Pakistan to get an idea and then where we are today after the natural disaster because natural disaster, it, it uh, provided us an opportunity to look at what was going wrong. In Pakistan, you know, there is uh, hardly any political commitment to um, educating the poor children. You know, we all have schools for our children, but the others uh, who are uh, the have-nots are uh, not really catered for. So the children who are enrolling into government schools, 40% of them will drop out in grade one. And the ones who will stay on will uh, not be learning very well. The, we, we did a test of uh, third graders um, and gave them a test of first grade. They, couldn't, they weren't able to do that. They weren't even able to write cat and bat and ball and uh, in, in our local languages as well. So the children who stay on are also, they, they drop out by uh, fifth grade. So dropouts is a huge issue. Political commitment uh, are budgets. We just have, we spent, last year we spent 1.5% of our GDP on education. Our defense budget is 60%. So uh, that is, so what happened with the floods? You know, when the floods happened, and we were, my organization was asked to go in to work in the floods. Uh, a, a lot of, like uh, you, uh, my colleague here is talking about Philippines, about child-friendly spaces. We started working with UNICEF on child-friendly spaces. And uh, most of the kids who came to these child-friendly spaces were not going to school. So basically, this whole, there was a revelation of what was going wrong. And these were areas these were areas which were not open to our eyes because these were under feudal landlords in southern Punjab, in Balochistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, and Sindh. These are workers who are working for larger landlords. So, uh, so we got an inside story to what was going on. And then, you know, what, what really helped was the media in Pakistan. The media in Pakistan today is so strong they hold the government accountable. The media was there, the government was not there when the floods happened. 
everybody hit because it was the huge magnitude. And it, the question was to save your own lands and get the water to the poorer areas. And the, the entire discussion was this. So the media was there instantly. The NGOs, the UN, everybody was there instantly. And there were no financing to help that as well. So hence, what the good thing that happened was that everybody started taking stock. I'll give you an example of, I work with all the four, uh, four uh, provinces. And uh, in Sindh, Sindh government started to rationalize. There were schools with just one room. There were schools with 80 children and one, chil uh, one teacher, multiple grades. And uh, there are supposed to be 43,000 schools in Sindh, out of which 50% are non-functional. If you go there, there are go schools. Their teachers enrolled and all that. So they started this rationalizing exercise of where we are going and where we should go. So that is something that all this pressure has come up. And my organization is working with uh, all the four provinces in developing strategies, in developing sector plans, and then rebuilding better. We are working with, um, uh, you know, uh, rebuilding schools that have been damaged. But how to rebuild them better? how to get children back into schools. And uh, so they are learning well. And, they are, they are, and, and communities involved. Parents are not involved. Parents are illiterate, so they don't know. If the child comes and uh, uh, you know, uh, decides to drop out, nobody is accountable for what, what's going on. So in terms of uh, taking stock off, I'll also just briefly like to mention here that uh, I'm, I'm a part of the Prime Minister's Education Task Force. So we were trudging along, you know, the same, you know, like everybody pointing fingers to, you know, nobody holding accountability. But after this, um, uh, this floods and after the rationalization started on educations in different provinces, uh, we have started uh, education emergency in Pakistan and media is involved in that. And, uh, you know, like, I I'll give you one example that uh, every year the cost of not educating the children who are out of school in Pakistan, it costs us a flood, which was nine billion dollars. So uh, the, that is the cost, and I think Pakistan remains, I have been to many, many other uh, developing countries, Pakistan remains one of the most challenged countries in terms of the education sector. But uh, so we are li linking, coming back to Roxy, your question, we are linking back uh, all of this, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the rebuilding after floods to the mainstream issues. So for us, that has been um, a positive thing to uh, link to. Paul, you look like you had something to jump in and say. Sure. Um, one of the, it's interesting that a lot of these problems, you see them a lot in Haiti. But Haiti, in many ways, is a lot worse because there's no system to be working through. Um, with Pakistan, as you said, Manaz, earlier, is that there is a public system. There is some kind of government accountability involved there. And there's something that we can work toward to help reform education in your country. But in Haiti, that's not so. And if you look at, and again, if you look at the GDP spending on education in Haiti, it's dismal. It's about 1.2%, I believe, something like that. It's one of the lowest in the world. Um, in terms of directly answering your question, Roxy, about uh, how important it is to get kids back into school after these disasters, in Haiti, this was extremely important because you had a lot of these kids who were so traumatized by this disaster, so incredibly traumatized. They lost everything, their homes, their possessions, many times their family members. And what school did, and I really wish we could show some of these videos right now, the ones that I produced last year, what school did was provide these kids a sense of order again. Some kind of semblance of, of something going on in their lives rather than just utter chaos, which is really what happened after the earthquake in January. We can't show the videos right now, but during your work on, and let me get it right, Haiti's Lost Children, is there any individual story that stands out and speaks on the transformation role of education? Yeah, absolutely, I'd say so. Um, one of the teachers that I did a story about, her name was Elzira Rokor. Uh, she works for a very good NGO uh, run by Maurice Kadar, who is a good friend of Bill Clinton's, actually. Um, she speaks at CGI, the actual ones in Chicago, and last, one, last year was in New York. Um, she runs a really good NGO focused on education reform in Haiti right now. And uh, one of the teachers that works for her, uh, she was a private school headmaster a uh, very inspirational story. She was a private school ha headmaster before the earthquake. And what happened was that the disaster destroyed her school, completely destroyed it, flattened it. And after that, she took to doing what she used to do. She was a singer by trade, also a nurse. But uh, what she did was that um, 
She's one of Haiti's elite, so she's very well off, very well educated, taught in America. Um, she took to the tent city camps, basically, and she started teaching Chopin, Beethoven, and all these great little th lectures on classical music and French influence, and she just went into these tent schools, and she just started teaching kids right after the earthquake. Um, and that's what she's still doing right now. I haven't talked to her in a few months. But um, very incredibly inspirational story, for sure. And even in the most dismal of circumstances, even after the earthquake, there are people in Haiti that um, really bring joy to other people. Absolutely. Amazing. Balls, your work is, is very interesting to me. Um, disaster risk management. Yeah. Can you really explain to me what disaster risk reduction means to you? Yeah. Um, disaster risk reduction, disaster risk uh, management is a kind of a strategic system. It's a kind of framework that identify, assess, and reduce risks. At the same time, um, disaster risk reduction that decrease the vulnerability of people, especially children, persons with disability, and that includes uh, management of the environment, and one thing which is very important in disaster risk reduction is that increases the capacity of people, meaning people have to understand all these kinds of hazards. And while they understand all these things, they should learn the coping mechanism, and at the same time, they have to do something. It's not just individual, but family, community, and there has to be systems that would address all these kinds of risks. And it's not just one person, but it has to be the government, it has to be a global concern in order to reduce, if not mitigate or prevent disaster. I want to talk to you about your groundwork. Yeah. Um, when we were supposed to speak on the phone yeah. in our conference call, you were in the middle of a natural disaster. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I want you to be able to provide, because there's so many young people here, some examples on how young people have been able to help with the impact and the climate change in your area. Yeah. In the context of the Philippines, like we have 21 typhoons every year. And we have two to five or six typhoons that has a landfall. That's only one hazard typhoon, except landslide, we have flash flood, we have earthquake, tsunami. Um, first, we have to believe that the children and young people can do it. They are not just beneficiaries of any program for disasters. But if you have the belief and you have, there are lots of proof that children can engage, like simple inclusion of children and young people in risk assessments. What are the hazards? What are the risks inside the classroom or at home or in the community? If they know the hazards, then they're beginning to be creatively offer solutions. That it's not just, hey, I know the hazard, but all these risks, all these issues can be raised in the local government unit. Amazingly, there are children as like 10 years old, 12 years old, that just, hey, Mr. Captain, hey, Mr. Mayor, I think all these risks are not being solved by the government. If not, then this is the time for us to move. So the children, first, they have to speak out. And there are enabling factors that are very important for a facilitator, like teacher, like college students, to allow children to speak. And, you know, Filipinos or most Asian people are shy. This is very important. Like Americans are very expressive. Hey, this is what I want. And that is very important that people can express. To me, that is very important. The right to participate, the right to, you know, to do the kind of democratic practice. And once people know that this is the risk and this is the problem, that to me, that's the beginning of everything. People are having the media, you can use your, your cell phone, you can use your video, you can use radio, you can do the broadcasting, and they start to speak. And once children, once young people start to talk, people, the adults will say, wow. And this is the beginning. For us, people in the third world country, in developing countries, once children, young, once young people are engaged, that creates change. And to me, that's amazing, that's very important. Manaz, you work a lot on trying to get young people engaged, especially university, college students. Do you want to talk about what their role would mean to you in Pakistan? 
Oh, extremely, extremely important in, in our work. Um, and it is uh, something that my um, two, um, you know, um, uh, Paul has talked about, Franz has talked about, you know, uh, teacher training and then, you know, uh, from teacher centered, taking it to child centered and uh, then colors, you know, just, just uh, I'm giving you some examples of um, how to bring back uh, life into, um, you know, these uh, temporary learning centers and then uh, building back uh, better. Uh, so that goes on, you know, that's, that's an international experience that, you know, children who were not exposed to all of this, then they are and we have to try to make it sustainable. Uh, in, in my organization, what we have been doing uh, for a very long time is to get interns and uh, youth like yourself. You know, we are swamped. We are, we are a national scale organization. We get projects upon projects upon projects. We need ideas. We need innovation. So we have a lot of people from local universities who are coming in and volunteering. You know, uh, students do volunteer for relief, for fundraising, uh, but uh, they are volunteering to uh, write uh, case studies, to do project proposals, to do uh, uh, analytical work for us, to do statistical work for us, and then, um, you know, very, very diverse activities, school in a bag, when children lost everything, we quickly set up, I said, you know, things have to be simple. You know, although the issues are so complicated in Pakistan, but the, the solutions are very, very simple. And the solutions, uh, the same solutions in Philippines, the same solutions in Haiti, you know, that, that's the solutions that apply. The children have to be in control, the parents have to be in charge, and they have to be in, in control of their own environment and be happy, learning well, being creative, and have the safety and security of that environment. So how do we support that, you know? So uh, once, in, in this flood, I'll give, uh, you know, we, we just had this uh, school in the bag program and then, you know, uh, colors and, uh, uh, teacher training, you know, getting students were involved in uh, getting the methodologies, you know, different levels of methodology. UNICEF has uh, child-friendly schools. We had interactive child-centered. Uh, you know, we are partnering with PLAN in Pakistan. So, you know, young students were coming in to work on this, you know, getting all this work together, developing modules. So, uh, we, were, we can do um, uh, with, with your energy you know, the kind of energy that you have. We have specific areas, some of the areas that I've mentioned, and uh, the students are, because it is very clear for Pakistan, you know, 50% of our youth is under the age of 15, that, you know, unless you uh, engage with the youth of Pakistan, and, and they want to be engaged, you know, I get calls all the time, I get, um, you know, Facebook messages all the time from st Pakistani students all over the world saying that how do we engage back to Pakistan? And so we have uh, on the ground work that is going on. Uh, you want to go to project sites, you want to be, I, I'll give you an example in Muzaffargarh, uh, you know, southern Punjab, where we are, re uh, re you know, sort of refurbishing, not entirely uh, uh, building up, but uh, partially damaged schools, 200 schools, which is a very large number for that area. And uh, so I said, you know, we have to get the youth involved. You know, there has to be a sense of responsibility. Usually it's the contractors and it's the, the government and the NGO that comes in, does the work and leaves and parents don't know, children don't know. So we got, you know, the local university, Bahaudin Zikriya University has an architecture department. You know, it's, it's more work for us, but we got their children, uh, their um, graduate students involved to do the assessments rather than the regular engineers who we pay. And they did a brilliant job. And they said, we didn't even know that these problems existed in the, because they, most of them had studied in private schools, the, uh, the schools that uh, Franz is talking about, uh, you know, in the local areas. And they said, we didn't even know that, uh, lo uh, you know, the public schools look like that. So we provide those kind of avenues for, uh, and it's absolutely important. And later on, I'd love to talk to you about possibilities because we need as much energy as, as uh, possible. And now we have a program coming up in uh, Sindh, Thatta, uh, whereby I'm getting the best of Karachi universities and generating ideas. You know, the, the financing has been okayed by UNOCHA, but I said that we will sit down on the table with university students and the government over there and develop plans. Schools, school buildings have to be redone, the modules have to be redone, and they have to be linked to the sector plan of the province and approved by the government. So that is the level of youth engagement that uh, we are working with. Paul, I want to talk to you because you were just a student a few years ago, sitting in basically... A few months ago. A few months ago, a recent graduate, so we could applaud him for that. Um, yeah. <laughs> First of all, 
as a lot of students that are sitting here and they're listening to the commitments that were achieved by other people, I want you to talk about how the university student could get involved and see their commitment all the way through to a level at which you have took it. Sure. Well, all I can really talk about is my experience as a journalist and how I worked with that set of skills to do international work. Um, there's a few things that you gotta be looking at. And I don't know where everyone is in terms of their journey in life, but what I could say is that the first step for me was to be able to go somewhere where there was a lot of people, a lot of groups that were into international work. Being able to surround yourself with people who are involved with, with this kind of subject. Um, I went to the University of Miami for my graduate studies. I don't know if there's any hurricanes in the room here, but no, not one? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but w what I did at the University of Miami was a very internationally focused program where you did a lot of photojournalism in a lot of other countries. I was in Eastern Europe, I was in Africa before I went to Haiti. Um, and you build off what you're good at. That's what I did. That's how I looked at it. I was always good at being able to tell other people's stories. And I thought journalism was always a very good fit for me. So I worked with that. And what that ultimately led to was a grant from the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. And uh, last year, in about spring, uh, I did a series of videos, one about healthcare in, in Miami. And if, if you're up to date with the statistics, Miami is one of the most underinsured uh, places in America right now. Uh, and then I did another video about Haitian migrant workers in uh, Brow uh, not Broward County, but uh, Homestead, which is a big farming agricultural community uh, in South Florida. Those two videos enabled me to you know, sell myself to the Pulitzer Center, it was part of a contest, and they said, okay, we'll give you $10,000. Um, now, go out there and find an international project that you'd be interested in reporting on. Great. Um, f financing is always incredibly important, I'm sure you all know that. Um, getting that money gives you also a sense of responsibility. You're, you're being given responsibility to complete something large, quite large. Um, in the case of Haiti, um, it's actually, if you've never been there, uh, it's actually quite expensive to go. Uh, it's easy to get there by plane. You can probably go online after this and you can buy a plane ticket to Port-au-Prince, but once you get there, that's the big question. Uh, how, how, how do you maneuver the country? But it's always, um, in the case of myself, you know, it was always important to plan um, and work with other NGOs. I worked with two. Um, making these partnerships, networking, um, finding this access, because for somebody like me as a journalist, finding access is always the key issue. Getting in with people who know people on the ground. And the two NGOs that I worked with are extremely helpful, very good. Uh, ProDev Haiti is one of them. Uh, the other one was on Techo Para Mi País. Um, if you're interested in looking at what they do, they love volunteers, they're doing a lot of great student work right now on techo.org. Um, both of them were more than willing to keep, take me in. You know, they knew what I was doing. They knew that you know, I had a certain intent in mind to uh, work on education reform in Haiti. And ProDev does a lot of great work too. Um, but it's key to make those partnerships. That's the key, absolutely. Bar none, Manaz and I were talking about this earlier. You need to be able to network with these NGOs that have this kinds of flexibility and have these kinds of contacts on the ground. I know of no other better way, because if you try to go it alone and you're in a situation where you know, you're not really being nurtured with these uh, international economic partnerships, you're really not gonna get anywhere that fast. But that would be my best advice. Before we open up the floor to questions from the students, um, I wanna ask one final question, if you could all take one minute to answer. On education, is it doing enough to help the climate change in your areas, and have you seen the change? What changes have you seen? Yeah, there are lots of initiatives right now, but it's not enough. Like um, in the Philippines, we have a very good law at this time. It's a climate change act, and we also have a Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. But it's still at the national level. The challenge is how to put this one at the provincial, municipal, and even at the barangay level or the, the village level. So education has to be like put in the context of 
what specific hazard, what specific risk in that particular area. Because if you just analyze one particular hazard, just flood or, or typhoon, it's not enough. It has to be a multi-hazard approach and there has to be multi-solution in a specific area, in a specific culture. So still lots of things to be done. In the Philippines, we have this curriculum development and we have learned a lot from the different countries, the experience from Pakistan, the Haiti experience, uh, the Indonesian experience and many other. Uh, so for our organization, Plan International, we have this kind of support like um, the NGOs must work together. If there is a cluster approach after disasters, the humanitarian uh, response, I think there are also ways how we can work together in terms of curriculum, in terms of practice at the local government unit. So lots of things to be done. Simplifying the jargon, disasters, climate change, hmm, that's only for the scientists, that's only for the academe, but you have to translate that at the very own language of the people. Yeah, I totally agree with Paul that, uh, you know, in, in case of Pakistan, you know, we're getting ready for another flood. You know, it, it's uh, uh, predicted that we will have another flood this year. But uh, this is what I know, but the communities, the children in schools don't know. Because uh, the UN, you know, the UN has taken charge of this uh, disaster management. We have a national disaster management uh, framework in Pakistan, and which is a bit slow, and it needs to be strengthened. The government is doing a lot of work. But uh, I, I'll, uh, you know, take uh, what Paul has said, which is uh, so uh, deeply entrenched in the programs that we do uh, with our children. We are working with a huge number of children, that it has to be children, it has to be household, it has to be local government, and it has to be in the curriculum. Because all these changes, and they are the managers of their lives, you know, we have very weak government systems, and it cannot be with the government or the international NGO. It has to be children, because it will continue to go, our glaciers are melting, and we are going to get more rain, and we are drought prone, we are earthquake, we are on the fault line, you know, earthquakes in Pakistan. So all of this has to be, and the child has to be, and, and youth can help in that. You know, do, do the research. You know, we are, we are the, the foot soldiers. We are on the ground. We are doing the hard work. But, uh, you know, uh, let's generate ideas here. How, how to go about doing that for the child, for the household, for the community. That's an interesting point that you raised there, that it's ultimately going to be up to the, the people of these countries to figure out the solutions for their problems. Because the international community can only do so much in this, these instances, is that they can provide aid, they can provide support, they can provide money. But one of the big things that everybody kept telling me when I was in Haiti is that the Haitian people need to hold their government accountable and find solutions to these problems that are born of their own realities and their own experience. Um, the international community is removed from it. They need to step back and say, how can we help them achieve their goals and their ideas and their plans? But in terms of responding to your question about climate change, is um, not a whole lot has been done on that, uh, especially in Haiti. But I, I will say that one of the big initiatives that I've been seeing, that I saw when I was there, was that um, there was a lot of teacher training where they were telling future teachers in Haiti how to explain earthquakes. And they were teaching classes on seismology and explaining all these kinds of, um, you know, ways to stay safe from earthquakes, what to do during an earthquake. Because one of the things that killed a lot of Haitians during that disaster was that nobody really knew what was going on. They didn't know what to do. They stayed in their homes, but their homes were built so poorly that, you know, the homes would collapse in them. Um, people didn't know that they had to either run outside or run in into certain places of cover. But um, you know, that, that's one of the things that I did see there in terms of, you know, trying to explain climate and they're trying to prepare for the future. Um, because you can see, actually, is that uh, still the majority of the population doesn't know how an earthquake works. They believed it was like the result of magic or voodoo or something like that. So it was very important that going forward in Haiti that people understand and are taught the signs behind these things. I appreciate all of you guys for talking. We, unfortunately, right now we have to open up the floor to questions from our students here, our participants here. If you have any questions for Baltz, Manaz, or Paul, you can raise your hand. Raise your hand. And somebody will come around with a mic. Somebody will come around with a mic. Do you want to trade? Uh, hello, 
My name is Yua Yang. I'm uh, from. Can you stand? Yeah. Thank you. And please let me know who. Let me know who you're addressing the question to. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Yua Yang. I'm from the University of the Pacific. It's kind of uh, more, I guess, towards you two. Um, I forgot your names, but uh, you guys talked about curriculum, and I was just wondering for emergency um, education for management teams. What exactly is there a core curriculum that? management teams should follow or should there even be a core generic re replicable uh, curriculum that management, management teams need to follow? That's a very good question. We have already the INEE. Uh, yes. Minas knows this one. We do too. Yeah. Um, we are part of the, the team. Um, there are lots of, it's being led by the United Nations and many other organizations. We have that, so if you want to just uh, try to, to, to visit, no? I in EE, -E, then find it, in, you can Google it, and then there are standards how to do it. Preparation, step one, two, three, four. What are the standards? What are the strategies? Then what are the domains? Then easily you can access that. And one thing which is very good, because we, have, we started in 2004, 2005, and now we have the latest edition to that the 2010 edition. So we have that. Yeah, um, I, I'd just like to add to that, that you know, um, having a curriculum is uh, another thing, but implementing it is, is the challenge. You know, we have the, 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 the you know, post-disaster curriculum, which is like a lot of energy has gone into that. But how to mainstream it with the government curriculum, which is already very weak, there are lack of text, textbooks and all that. And besides curriculum, to have the pedagogical skills uh, that we have been working with, like uh, my organization works with um, around 10,000 teachers. So, uh, but you know, we, we are, but, but 10,000 teachers are not representing the entirety of Pakistan and, and other organizations, PLAN and uh, UN and others are also doing this. But you know, but this has to be totally mainstreamed. So um, the curriculum is there and now we need strategies how to the government to take ownership and private sector, we also have uh, low income private sector in Pakistan that the private sector takes ownership of that. Any more questions? Hello, my name is Olivia Wong, and I'm currently working on a commitment towards a world free of nuclear weapons. Um, my question is for all of the speakers today, since it's very relevant to everyone in this room. Um, much of the discussion today, it's been regarding education due to, post, uh, due to natural disasters. But the nuclear radiation as a result of the nuclear plant meltdown in Japan is essentially a preventable man-made disaster to which we should have a feasible solution to. My question is, what type of education do you believe must be provided to the youth regarding nuclear material, be it power plants or nuclear weapons, so that our generation can prevent a future nuclear hazard or a catastrophe? That's a very challenging question, you know. <laughs> Uh, personally, um, there are industries today that should be stopped. That's very, to me, it's very challenging. But um, I would see things like, why are we doing this? When we found these things, it is not good. So education has to be, in other words, education must not be reactive. Well, we established all these things, all these industries, and now we are educating. We, 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 have, we should, we should uh, do this because everything is there. The science says that if this is not good, why do it? This is now between commerce and the benefit of the people. That's my answer. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, talking from Pakistan's perspective, you know, where uh, survival is the most important. We have kids, you know, who are um, in Sindh right now. 60% uh, of the, the children have been reported with stunted growth because of lack of uh, nutrition uh, and uh, all, uh, where education 
is uh, not a right but a privilege. So um, I think Pakistan is not ready for this kind of a discussion. But but the poorer, you know, like we have a lot of di diversity and a lot of hierarchical relationships. But um, uh, you know, like for instance, you're you're quoting Japan, and it is very relevant. I was listening to the news this morning that you know, in your West Coast in the U.S., the milk is sort of contaminated. You know, and the whole series of, so it is affecting the world. So it is about not just a disaster happening, but a disaster in the making. That, uh, you know, the, the like, uh, we are uh, a nuclear nation, like we have this Islamic bomb that we are very proud of, right? So, but, but the, the, the question is to start off with a discussion about that this bomb can just transpire on ourselves. So media awareness, for instance, for, for Pakistani context is extremely important that we should start, we have a lot of, like I said earlier, that our media is very, very strong. We hold the government accountable uh, to, to the task. So media should start having uh, this kind of a discussion for the, in, in case of Pakistan and, and for the region itself, because we are loggerheads with the, our neighbors. So it, it's, it's a regional discussion that should be instigated. Um, well, I can answer it pretty briefly. Uh, Haiti doesn't have any nuclear weapons or nuclear energy, so we don't really have to worry about that there. But uh, um, in terms of, I can just remark about that and from a journalist's point of view, um, a lot of what's coming out of Japan right now has been really hyped up by the American media, especially. Um, A lot of the experts I spoke with, I, I just interviewed a uh, radiology professor at the University of Columbia in New York, who's saying that this is nowhere near Chernobyl levels, nowhere near. And I, I don't think, I think there are arguments to be made against nuclear power, but I really want to say that the jury's still out whether we should continue with that or not. When did you say it was an, at least an eye-awakening experience, what happened in Japan, to to think about ways of not being able to um, have that type of disaster. At least it opened up the eyes of the media and of the people to start checking our own nuclear power plants to make sure that this type of disaster wouldn't happen on our soil. Would you at least agree to that? Yeah, I, I think it's very important that we should be questioning safety procedures always. And y if you look at Japan, they had tremendous safety procedures, but it was a perfect storm of many different factors that collaborated to create a mega disaster, essentially. Um, I mean, yes, it is important that we question these procedures because you have a lot of nuclear plants in the United States that are along fault lines or near centers of population. You look at New York City, where I'm from, you have Indian Point that's just a few miles north of, uh, of Manhattan. So um, absolutely, we should be questioning this all the time. But there is a difference between thoughtful questioning and logical inquiry uh, as opposed to hype and craziness and, oh, this is the world's ending kind of stuff. More questions? Uh, my, good morning. My question this morning is, or this afternoon is addressed to Paul. Um, what is an alternative to private school institutions in Haiti if there's no government infrastructure with regards to education to begin with? Thank you. That's a really good question. And that's what education experts in that country are really trying to figure out right now. There's a bunch of schools of thought with this, um, and to make this to to make this a short answer, um, there are some people who say that what Haiti needs right now is something very similar to what you know a, a lot of other developing countries have put in place. Sort of is a universal public education system where kids do not have to pay for their education. An average Haitian family lives on $1,300 U.S. a, day, uh, a year. And these private schools gouge them with these absurd fees like uh, uniform fees, registration fees, graduation fees, things that they simply cannot afford. And what, they, what really needs to happen in Haiti right now is a universal system that's free and available. But the question then becomes is that, well, how do they do that if there's no constant revenue stream, no dependable revenue stream for the Haitian government? Um, Right now, some people are saying we should just take baby steps. There's no way we can expect that we're going to have a universal system from kindergarten to the 12th grade right away, immediately. Some people are suggesting that we should uh, think about just teaching them like uh, uh, trades rather than focus so much on literacy. I'm not saying there's any right answer to this question. The answer is still very much up in the air. We're st they're still trying to figure it out. But 
from what I've learned, from what I've heard, is that you need to create some kind of universal accountable system in Haiti, something that's public and it's free and available to all, regardless of class. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question. Can we get some from the back of the room? Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Gibran. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania. This is more directed towards Murnaz. I wanted to ask you, um, you know, first, what would you want to see students from America doing to work um, to build more sustainable educational programs in the villages of Pakistan? But then also, how do you build the awareness from the United States for children over there to learn about, you know, disasters and what that exactly means for their uh, communities? I think uh, a very, very important question. And um, uh, because I think that that's the most important purpose of this interaction is to connect. Uh, because without connecting to this energy, we, 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 are, we are so um, inwards uh, looking towards our own complexity and how to go about it. I think the students can um, uh, do a lot of things, particularly in, in the case of Pakistan. We have different regions. For instance, my organization is working with different provinces. And uh, we need um, uh, you know, um, uh, students who, who can write good case studies, uh, share you know now the you 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 guys are so tech savvy you know i mean i i i don't know twitter and all these things so but i i can provide you with all the on ground experiences so get the case studies going because there there is there is positive energy on the ground and you you need to link up with that we need uh, you know analytical like statistical for instance i'm going into this new area that we are going to work in that we don't really know what the stats uh, st statistics is all about and my uh, organization people are totally bogged down you know so that uh, that and innovative you know innovative responses to getting children into school because i i have seen and i totally believe in the fact that you know the ideas and the responses coming from the youth are much better to the cookie cutter approaches and we have tried out a lot of ideas. And you know, so a couple of uh, these things in terms of uh, writing, uh, connectivity, awareness raising, extremely important, linking to the positive energy um, is, um, and, and we can be your avenue uh, in, in uh, getting you in, uh, engaged with other university uh, students and on the ground experiences. I'm, I'm very open to um, anybody who wants to link up to our organization. It's hard work. It's hard work getting students on board and you know designing programs for them to to work on, uh, but um, uh, you know read up on the situation in Pakistan and read up you know my. my um, own website has a lot of information on the Pakistan situation. So, um, and, and then uh, just, uh, just link up and, uh, you know, a, a couple of uh, things would be there for you to work on and uh, you can immediately start working on that. Yeah. Thank you to all our panelists. Thank you for all your questions.